Dr. Christy Kessler. Um, she earned her doctorate in educational leadership and innovation in 2003. As a part of her commitment to be a best teacher and role model, she could be, she achieved certification through the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards, or the NBPTS. Even though this certification is generally recognized as a program for K-12 teachers, rarely as a university professor sought or achieved this recognition, but Christy did exactly that in 2005. In her role as an associate professor at the university, she was guided scores of teachers through successful achievement of the NBPTS certification. And currently, Christy is a professor for the ITE Elementary. <laughs> so, um, give a round of applause for our um, guest speaker, Christy You may have thought you wanted to teach, 
but you chose to try something else, and now you're back and you're becoming certified. And so it was later on that you had that big aha moment for you. And regardless of how we came to decide we wanted to be teachers, I bet you everybody sitting in this room can remember that time, that excitement, that electricity that you used to feel when you converted either your playroom or your bedroom into your very first classroom. And it was awesome, because you had make-believe desks, and you would have a little chalkboard or poster board that you could write on, and you were the one. It was awesome because you were really excited. If you had a younger brother or sister, you could teach them the spelling words and maybe they would get one right. Or you could teach them the latest math thing. And that was the driving force. I had to be a teacher. I love it. I love to play. I love to play this. And having my own classroom is the best thing in the world. And then for the rest of us, it was that exhilarating rush of adrenaline. Or as I would call sometimes, power or control of being in charge of our own little makeshift classroom. And when our friends came over, they got to be the student. And we thought that was so cool because we got to decide who wrote on the chalkboard or who got to draw in front of the class. We got to assign their grades. And yes, even for those good times, we got to assign detention. And then it was all fine, well, and good until the roles reversed and you became the student. But whatever the reason, teaching brings with it tons of electricity. And that idea of being in your own space, your own place, and developing who you are as a teacher has sustained you from the very beginning of when you decided you want to teach. And it's something you're going to need to keep in your back pocket. And for the remainder of your career, you're going to have to pull it out. You're going to have to remember that, OK? In today's world, we have a tendency, and I did just this past summer when I was returning to work after two years of being on sick leave, we have a tendency to think to ourselves, oh, for the love of teaching, this is not what I signed up for. It's that very statement um, that conjures up within us, within the public, Within politicians, within everybody we know, a lot of emotions, and it brings with it a lot of connections that we automatically make to buzzwords that are out there in our world that are part of your everyday vocabulary. You know what they are standards, high stakes testing, no child left behind, maybe not as much as race to the top, but it's still there. And of course, my new BFF, Common Core. Like I said, I was gone from the workplace for two years. And so when I was coming back in the fall, it was I who became a student all over again, learning how to maneuver and make my way through. Most of those buzzwords tend to bring negative feelings with them. And I know you all are probably thinking, oh great, here we go. We're going to hear from a speaker who's going to focus on those buzzwords and give us all these statistics and tell us why they're not so bad or maybe why they are bad. But that's not what I'm here to do today. Instead, I'm pulling some of those buzzwords, okay? And I want to share with you some examples of how I've turned them into positives, how they became the very reason I was successful as a teacher and hopefully you'll still be able to be successful. When I was teaching high school in Maryland, and I spent 11 years in Maryland before coming to Hawaii, high stakes testing and standards were introduced to us, and this was in the late 90s. Now, we didn't call it high stakes testing, we called it our high school assessment test. The kids had to pass them in order to graduate. They not only had to pass your class, then they had to take this, this assessment in order to get their high school diploma. And I was like you guys, every year, beginning of the school year when we have professional development, as you sit in your staff meetings with your mentor teachers, it always felt like we were getting one more thing added onto our plate. And we were wondering, oh, for the love of teaching, this isn't what I signed up for. I thought by year five, after I taught the same grade level or same subject, maybe I would know it by now. But it seemed like things were always changing. 
the way we were going to teach. This year we're going to use thinking maps. This year we're going to try different constructive, uh, constructivist activities. This year we're going to try different cooperating, cooperative learning. This year we're going to try some new service learning techniques. And yet I found myself as I was sitting there as a teacher thinking, okay, I have this frustration because now I've got to retrain my brain. I've got to rethink where I thought I was going, what I thought I knew, and figure out how to add this into it, okay? The key is, I had to find a way to go back to compassion for being a teacher. I had to pull out my back pocket why I wanted to be a teacher, how I knew in third grade that teaching was for me, and that yes, now I had four walls. And instead of my makeshift classroom in my bedroom, using the bed as different desks that were partitioned off by rows of string, uh, I was now able to be in my classroom and help kids. After all, that passion is what drove me to be called to be a teacher. So instead of focusing on all the negatives, the things we were reading in the paper at that time, it's funny because it's the same kind of message that's coming out sometimes in the press today about test scores and students aren't doing this and students aren't doing this. And we want to look at, instead of just observing teachers, we want a standardized system for doing evaluation. These things were all there back in the mid to late 90s when I was teaching in Maryland. And I realized I can let this drag me down or I can move on from it. Moving on doesn't mean ignoring it. Moving on doesn't mean you forget who you are, that you forget your teaching voice. Moving on means you are committed to helping your students each step of the way to be successful in the system that we have right now. Now I'm not telling you how to respond or to how to be a participant in leadership activities for change or anything like that, but while we do make decisions to do or not do certain things after school or whatever with legislators or whatever, we still have to remember that we have to at the same time help our students navigate the system they're in. And probably the most important thing that we oftentimes put aside as teachers, we have to remember to take care of ourselves, who we are, why we're passionate about why we teach. How are we going to do this? How do we continue to make a difference? After all, you're the teacher. You're the one that makes the difference day in and day out. When I was teaching, I reached that point, the fifth or sixth year, where I was saying to myself, do I keep doing this or do I get out? Do I stick with it? Because once I hit year 10, I'm vested. It's going to be really hard to find a job where I can get my health benefits, where I can get my step salary that I have, where I can uh, have a retirement that I can look forward to. And it was that year that I decided I'm in for the long haul. Okay? And so I want to share with you two stories um, that made the difference in the long run. And it's my hope that you're going to have these same kind of stories. I had been teaching social studies, uh, AP European history for several years. And that time came when the principal called me into his office and he asked me, I would take that class. And you know what that class meant. They were all the students who were taking world history for the third time. They were all seniors. They all had to pass it to graduate. And they had been told for 12 years that they were not college material. That the most that they were going to be able to hope for was going to be probably service type jobs where they would make minimum wage. And here I was, honored that I was asked to teach this group, sad because AP European history had become kind of like my hallmark of teaching. I was becoming quite successful. And at the same time, we just found out that we were getting a whole new set of standardized uh, high school going to be in effect for that coming year, along with a whole new set of Maryland State High School standards. 
So I thought about it. 30 seconds later, I said, sure, I'll do it. Never turn down a challenge, guys. Never turn down a challenge. Especially when it comes to the type of kids you're going to teach, okay? I knew that getting the kids to pass the content was no big deal. I knew my material inside and out. I also knew that I was a good teacher, okay? That is what I signed up for, to teach, to help all kids learn. I was there. I knew I could do it. I had a really good track record, okay? But let me tell you what I didn't sign up for. There's a young man named Jason. He was a senior in high school and he hated school. He hated teachers, he hated anybody with authority. And it was on a regular basis that I would go home from teaching that class and I would have very, very late nights, sometimes not sleeping at all, where I would try to figure out how do I get those students motivated and engaged, one, and two, how do I turn this around for Jason? In Jason, I saw things that I didn't see in very many other students, and that was his tactile mechanical skills. Things that he could build and put together while he was sitting in my class, trying to tune me out. Things that he could build out of pencils and paper clips and paper, and then throw them at the teacher. <laughs> but it was my job to try to figure out how to channel that energy, okay? Try to get him to see the value of who he was. So halfway through the semester, I came up with this grand idea. Instead of worrying about parent conferences twice a year and only calling home when something bad happens, I decided to send a letter home to all the students in that class, a personal letter for each one of them, sharing with them what they'd accomplished so far. A week later, I got a phone call from Jason's mom, and she was in tears. She said, I need to come in to see you. Now I'm dreading. I'm sweating. I get the guidance counselor. I get the principal. We're all sitting there. And in comes Jason's mom, and she says, do you have Kleenex? And I'm like, oh, no. This is not what I signed up for. And she sat down, and she said, in 12 years, I've never gotten a positive letter, phone call, or anything from one of Jason's teachers. And I can't tell you what it means to me to have something to hang on my refrigerator. And there, in all of my frustration of trying to figure out how to balance all of the demands that were coming down on teachers from the state, the mission was obvious. I was there for the kids. Help them navigate how to get through and be successful, not just at school, but afterwards. So Jason went on to become a sergeant in the Marine Corps where he eventually uh, had an honorable discharge after 10 years, and now he's a very successful Maryland State Trooper with three children, and two of which were, who were featured on America's Funniest Home Videos last week, uh, doing their own little role play of being a drill sergeant. And he's doing very well. Late last year, when I was preparing to come back to work, I received an email from a former student different student, who also happened to be one of my basketball players. She had no idea that I was sitting there in my living room, stressing, really having anxiety attacks about going back to work. How do I navigate the future? How do I navigate all the things that are happening? Because my mission is still obvious. You're my students. How do I get you through and then help you to stay the course, be successful with what's, or what are things that you may not be able to control instantaneously. How do I help you become successful? Get tenure, stay in the job that you like. But also, I was also navigating the slippery slope of Race to the Top, which came into play while I was out on sick leave. It was interesting. Janet's letter went something like this. She graduated, by the way, in 2000. How was Hawaii? I'm back in Port Deposit and I teach social studies now at Northeast Middle School. I coach the field hockey team and I chase my two boys around. As a coach, I now look back at basketball and want to thank you for all the inspiration you gave to us as young girls. I try to use that when I am out 
when I'm out there with those girls to show them that they have a future and through sports and school they can become very successful. We now have a handful of girls who play in college and it is a comfortable circle for me to see the impact good role models like you can set. So thanks. Out of the blue, I have not heard from Janet since her second year of college. With that short email, I was reminded that my strong dedication to success of the whole child is really important. Yes, we're told about academics. Yes, we're told about standards. But we have to remember that children have a body, mind, and spirit. So do we. And so, being that my mission is to focus on that body, mind, and spirit, I again face with sleepless nights of how do I get through this? How do I do the right thing? And I'm reminded of the years of many, many tears of joy and tears of sadness when my own students would be going through life-changing events. And then so many reasons why I still wanted to be a teacher. And then I found myself remembering that it's my job. It's my job that has become my life. It's what sustains me every day. I'm one of the lucky ones. I got to, I got to choose to be a teacher twice. Once when I was way little, and then once after I had a life-saving stem cell transplant. I had the choice, and I have to come back here and be a teacher. We don't always agree with the constraints of our daily jobs, but if we remember what our passion is, if we remember our teacher voices, which is really important, because you guys are just starting to form that voice, if you remember that you can be creative 